It's May 3rd, 1934. Cries of the townsfolk follow the car carrying two bullet-ridden corpses as they are paraded through the streets of Arcadia, Louisiana. At long last, the notorious outlaws Bonnie and Clyde have been brought to justice by former Texas Ranger Frank Hamer. Hamer was no stranger to gunfights. When he was only 16, he worked as a ranch hand for a man named Dan McSwain. Dan approached Frank with an offer to kill a man for hire, but Frank refused. Scared that Hamer would go to the police, McSwain shot Frank in the back with a shotgun, wounding, but not killing him. After tending to his wounds, Frank went back to the farm and confronted McSwain. Tension snapped, and both men reached for their guns. When the dust settled, Frank walked away, with the rancher dead on the floor. Thus, the Frank Hamer legend was born. One part Texas cowboy, one part Texas gunslinger. Despite his growing reputation, Frank was just an ordinary Texas farm boy. He was born on March 17, 1884, on a ranch in Fairview, Texas, just outside of San Antonio. Growing up, Frank worked as a calf wrangler on his small ranch, as well as his father, Smithy. As a young boy, he went to school in Oxford, Texas, which led to his staple joke of being the only Oxford-educated ranger. Now, in 1905, Hamer's true calling began to manifest. The local sheriff in Fairview was impressed by his detective skills when he helped track down a horse thief. The sheriff gave his recommendation that Frank join the Texas Rangers. And that's exactly what he did. It became apparent that Frank Hamer was born and bred for the role of a Texas lawman. He loved the thrill of his work. His cowboy grit allowed him to thrive on the open range, and his natural intuition of people allowed him to sense danger and deceit. Hamer's first two years as a ranger were spent patrolling the Mexican border alongside the company of Captain John H. Rogers. He would later return to the rangers, but in 1908, he took time off to serve in a different office. At the age of 24, he resigned from the rangers to become city marshal in Navasota, Texas, an oil boom town that had been overrun with violence and crime. Shootouts on the main street were so frequent that over the course of two years, at least a hundred men had been killed. Lawmen typically didn't last long in Navasota because they were either intimidated or bought off or shot. Hamer came in, cleaned house, and tamed the town. By 1911, his work in Navasota was done. Possibly bored with the city's newfound tranquility, he packed up his family and moved to Houston to work as a special investigator. His partnership with the sheriff's office led to his next job in Kimball County as a livestock theft investigator. After seven years away, Frank began to long for the adventure he once knew. He decided to rejoin the Rangers in 1915 and patrol the South Texas border around Brownsville. After some time on the Rio Grande, Frank resigned from the Rangers once again. He then worked as a range detective for the Texas Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association. Now 33 years old, Hamer met and married his wife, Gladys Johnson, and stepped into the role of father for her two daughters. Gladys had been widowed after her first husband was murdered. Many people accused her of killing her own husband, but she was never convicted. Still, her past haunted the couple. On a family trip, the Hamer stopped in Sweetwater, Texas to buy gas when they were ambushed by Gus McMeans, a relative of the slain ex-husband, an ex-Texas ranger, and an old enemy of Hamer. Once again, Frank was victorious, walking away with his life, while McMeans lay dead on the ground with a bullet in his chest. In 1922, seven years later, Hamer had left the Cattlemen's Association and rejoined the Rangers, making it his goal to clear up the deep-rooted criminal organizations in Texas. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan and organized crime rings. One specific incident brought Hamer's fame to national levels. In 1928, Hamer toppled an illicit and bloody scheme dubbed the Banker's Murder Machine. The Texas Bankers Association had began offering rewards of $5,000 for dead bank robbers, not one cent for live ones. Hamer discovered that corrupt men had arranged for deadbeats and two-bit outlaws to attempt bank robberies only to be caught and shot. The men who set up the low-tier crooks then collected finder's fees from responding officers who killed the robbers and collected their reward. When Frank blew the whistle, the police refused to support him. The Bankers Association defended their scheme, claiming any man that could be induced to participate in a bank robbery ought to be killed. 
Hamer compiled the evidence, wrote an article, and handed out copies at the state capitol. The public became enraged, investigations ensued, and justice was served. Although Hamer was revered and loved by the public, he always did what he believed was right, and couldn't be pressured by the masses. A prime example of this was when he and a handful of rangers were charged with protecting the trial of a black rape suspect, George Hughes, in the town of Sherman, Texas. A mob approached the courthouse intending to lynch Hughes. Hamer shot and wounded two rioters. Hamer's gunplay enraged the crowd even further. They set the courthouse ablaze and used dynamite to blow open the cell where Hughes was held. Hamer and his allies escaped in a car after a valiant effort to protect the accused. Hamer retired in 1932 after spending nearly 27 years as a ranger. Hamer's reasoning for retiring was because Governor Miriam Ma Ferguson had moved to abolish the force, leading to a number of rangers to resign in protest. Thankfully, due to friends in the rangers and the reputation he had earned, the captain of the rangers allowed Frank to keep his title of senior ranger captain, even with his official retirement. Although he had left the rangers, he had no intention of leaving the action. Frank was hired by the Texas prison system to hunt down two specific fugitives, Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow. He was commissioned to bring them to justice by any means necessary. He took the job in 1934 and joined forces with retired ranger Manny Galt. Hamer and Galt spent 102 days tracking Bonnie and Clyde. Finding the fugitives proved to be difficult. Word quickly spread when the lawmen came into town, and Bonnie and Clyde would disappear every time. Few people were willing to help the lawmen. In fact, most locals hated Hamer and Galt. Bonnie and Clyde were small town heroes. They stole money from the state and gave to the poor, just like Robin Hood, but with a lot more killing. Although the Barrel Gang was favored by the public, their reputation was starting to slip. Their careless acts had led to a shift in public opinion. Eyewitnesses had watched Bonnie Parker murder a beloved town patrolman named Holloway D. Murphy. The eyewitness claims to have seen Bonnie unloading her gun into patrolman Murphy's body, laughing as his head bounced like a rubber ball. As the public saw Bonnie and Clyde's true colors, their luck began to run out. Whenever the Barrow Gang made an appearance, Hamer was close behind, gathering clues and predicting where they would head next. Hamer discovered their pattern. The Barrow Gang seemed to almost make a huge circle around Dallas, Joplin, Missouri, and Northwest Louisiana, making a point to stay close to state lines. The lawmen made plans to intercept Bonnie and Clyde in Arcadia, Louisiana. Frank knew that Bonnie and Clyde were not going to be taken alive, and he knew what was necessary to stop these outlaws. On May 23rd, at 9.15 in the morning, Hamer sprang an ambush on the outlaws. Hamer and Galt opened fire on the Barrow Gang's 1934 V8. Over 150 shots were fired, so many that locals mistook it for a logging crew using dynamite to fell a massive tree. The bullet-riddled car was loaded up on a truck and carried through the streets, with the bodies still inside. The killing of Bonnie and Clyde brought Hamer a bombardment of fame, but often for the wrong reasons. Small towns still loved the Barrow Gang, and their fame was widespread. Despite the trail of bodies behind them, they were viewed as anti-establishment heroes. Hamer avoided any form of attention for his actions, good or bad. He didn't even attend the Hamer Galt Hero Day in Austin. He refused any interviews about the Bonnie and Clyde investigation. He maintained a low profile for the rest of his career. Frank's health slowly declined after suffering a stroke in 1953, and he passed away in his sleep two years later. The end came quietly for this true Texas cowboy gunslinger, lawman, and hero. A Texas life lived on the edge.